Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Donna Brazil is a veteran political strategist and regular commentator on CNN and ABC News. She began her political career at the age of nine when she worked to support a city council candidate who promised to build a playground in her neighborhood. Some decades later, and innumerable state and local campaigns later, she is still working for change. She has brought her talent and skills to every presidential campaign from 1976 to 2000. She served as campaign manager for candidate Al Gore during the 2000 election. She has been a lecturer at the University of Maryland, a fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics, and she's currently adjunct professor of women and gender studies at Georgetown University. In her presentation today, the election's over, now what? She will share her perspective on the challenges facing our president, Congress, and our country in the years ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Donna Brazil. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and thank you for your kind and gracious introduction. I, I must tell you, as a, a Catholic woman, to, to be able to sit in the pulpit here, I... <laughs> my, my. Indeed, it is a great honor to return to the wonderful state of Minnesota, to be here in this historic church, and I want to acknowledge all of the elected officials and members of the clergy and, of course, the church and lay community, our sponsors, Becky and Anita, the YWCA, all of our community leaders. But I, I must tell you, at the age of 52, yeah, this is what it looks like now. <laughs> For those of you listening on radio, I'm just pretending to have some hair that's turning a little bit, uh, let's just say, gray. But about 30 years ago, I had an opportunity, an opportunity that most young people love to have, and that is to work on my first presidential campaign. Now, being a Louisianian, I didn't have a lot of choices, but there was this former from the state of Georgia that I liked. I liked his accent. I could translate everything he said. <laughs> and although I wasn't yet ripe enough to hold a very important and influential position. I did participate. I encouraged others to get involved and register to vote. And a few years later, after I finished my college education, I moved up to Washington, D.C., had an opportunity to work on the bill to make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. And then Reverend Jesse Jackson tapped me to work on his campaign to do voter registration campaigns all across the country. And when his campaign was over, when he came up short on delegates, I had one of the rarest opportunities. I had an opportunity to work for Vice President Walter Mondale. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Little girls like me that grew up poor, grew up in the segregated South, we looked up to men like Walter Mondale, men like Hubert Humphrey, men who went out there each and every day when they were in the United States Senate. They were fighting for poor people. They were champions for equality. And so when I had that opportunity to work for Walter Mondale, I got a secondary treat. I got an opportunity to also work for Geraldine Ferraro. When Vice President Mondale selected her, so thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your tremendous service to our nation, 
for being an inspiration and a role model to so many of us. And I can tell you what a great honor it is to see you as well. I'm proud to have served on your campaign. And I have to tell you, since that day, I've worked on seven more, <laughs> including one where I won and lost on the same night. <laughs> uh, no matter what I said, I was Al Gore's campaign manager. I can't win. Uh, that's, that's what I learned in Florida. 59, 59 senatorial campaigns and congressional campaign, 19 state and local campaigns. Young people, those of you who are counting, 49 states, one more state, I'm going to become Miss USA without the bikini. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that. Well, breaking news, I'm not on CNN, so let me tell you the breaking news. Mitt Romney just arrived at the White House to meet with President, Oma uh, President Obama. My Lord, I, I hope they, they're putting something on the menu that is uh, going to help us solve some of our, our problems. I wish I was there. I would cook up some succotash. <laughs> Those men come, would come out there saying, you know what? We have solved all of the world's problems. <laughs> and we can just uh, tell Congress to go back to doing nothing. And uh, <laughs> we've solved the problems. But I hope, I hope they... Uh, they're reaching a card. If for no other reason, I think most Americans after this long heated electoral season would just like to see our leaders sit down and work together. There's nothing wrong with civility. There's nothing wrong with reaching across the aisle. <laughs> Finding the best ideas and the solutions to advance the common good. That's what we all want. That's what we want. So after a tough campaign and a resounding victory, there's a natural tendency to relax. And it's true, time is needed to recover one's energy, reassess strengths and weaknesses, and review pr politics and priorities. And unless politics is your profession, and it is mine, or activism is in your blood, and it's in my blood, there's also a tendency to go back to the other concerns, to rely on the people we just elected to give voice to our hopes and our aspirations, to confront our concerns, in simple words, to get things done. Even the losing side has representation. That's the power of our system. As President John Kennedy once said, without debate, without criticism, no administration, no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. Regardless of your party affiliation, our politics, our politics or our preferences, we share the same goal, the same American dream, an opportunity to succeed, a support system that rewards hard work. But it is also there when, despite our best efforts, we hit a wall, a fall on hard times. There's a song from the 70s. Um, young people, forgive me. Uh, I know I can do some rap, but that's, a, that's another conversation. <laughs> but there's a song from the 70s, some of you might have remembered it or recall it, Bill Withers. It was called Lean On Me. I was only 12 when it came out, but it's a song that still resonates today. And the words go, you can just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you'll understand. We all need somebody to lean on. Of course, I would add sister into the lyrics. <laughs> but after all of the hurricanes I've had in my life, storms like Betsy, Camille, Katrina, and now Sandy, and those are just big weather events because we all have personal hurricanes, emotional tornadoes, as it were, the idea that we all need somebody to lean on and that we're all in this together seemed truer than ever. There's more to the American dream than success, whether in business or the arts or the sciences or whatever field you choose. Having a home, a safe place to raise your kids, making sure they have a chance to make things better by getting a good education, access to health care. We sometimes forget that there's, there's this American dream, this, this right, this right. It is the first of them, life, even before liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And it's one of the reasons for the Constitution providing for the general welfare. 
The American dream is a universal dream, a world of goodness and kindness, and a world where there's peace. Peace. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, a world of health and prosperity. But we can argue, we can argue as Americans, as citizens of this great country, on how to get there, how to provide for the common good. And we should, because no one has a monopoly on good ideas or on the truth. Or as David Hume said, truth emerges from arguments among friends. So as I said, even the side that loses an election still has a voice, still has a representative at the table, and that's as it should be. Still, an election is about choices. The issues were clearly stated, often despite the media and my fellow pundits. And when an election is won by an electoral landslide and a popular mandate, I think we have to pay attention to the issues. In a country as diverse as ours, it's hard to talk about the will of the people as a unitary thing, except in times of great national crisis. Still, I believe President Barack Obama has a mandate. I use that word because it has been a subject of debate recently, the debate of whether or not we are going to move the country forward. President Obama chose that word. He chose it as his slogan. And I think we should all look forward as we address the question, what now? We'll see that it was a well-chosen slogan. First, though, a word about the extent of the president's re-election victory. He got 332 electoral co college votes. That's almost 62% of the total. By any reckoning, that's a landslide. His popular vote margin of victory was greater than that of Kennedy, Nixon, Carter, or Bush. His percentage of the popular vote was greater than that of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and Bill Clinton in 96. I didn't work on the one, but I worked on the other. <laughs> but in Congress, the theme of forward also won. A year ago, most analysts thought the Democrats would have a hard time holding on to the United States Senate. But we increased. The Democrats increased their numbers there. And the Democrats also increased their number, their numbers in the House. In fact, this morning, we won a low seat in North Carolina. <laughs> and I'm only touching on the results at the national level. Still, the country remains divided. Governor Romney did receive 47% of the popular vote. An ironic number. <laughs> so even though the election, even though the election was a referendum on the seven critical issues, the choice to move forward while clear is still contentious. I would like to therefore talk about what I consider the seven critical issues of the campaign, why I feel the results vindicate we made the right choice, and the what now for each of them. These issues are the path of truth versus the path of lies, people versus money, economic fairness versus Robin Barron vulture capitalism, <laughs> diversity versus homogeneity, and an open door versus a closed door, health care versus neglect of the sick and the disabled, and finally, hope versus fear. The first issue was, would we choose the path of truth or the path of lies? We live in a world where information is easy, but facts remain stubborn, and sometimes facts are hard to find. We live in an age where opinions go viral, and too often infect the body politics with diseases, like slander and irrational hatred. Facebook used to have a thumbs up or a thumbs down for responses. There's no more thumbs down, but there's a lot more unfriending. The speed of thought may match the speed of light, instant messaging our impulses, but the process of thinking things through still takes time. 
the prophet Isaiah quoted the Lord as saying, come, let us reason together. And God was talking about forgiveness and second chances. In such a world, deceit and a cynical disregard for the truth can grow like, well, like a virus. The simple thing to do here would, would be to point out the many stretch the truth beyond the breaking point excesses of the Republican campaign. And there were many. Stephen Bennon of the B Mattel Blau kept a weekly log he called Mint, Mint Mendacity. He reported 917 falsehoods since January. That's 23 a week. The New York Times, you know, for confession, I would never have gotten away with that. There's not that much soap in the Catholic Church. <laughs> the New York Times in a pre-election analysis said the Romney campaign made a strategic decision to set new standards in the use of untrue campaign. Now that's a polite way of saying they plan to lie a lot and hope people wouldn't notice. The Washington Post title is pre-election editorial, Romney campaign insults voters. All of this is online, you can fact check me. I raise these points not to relive the campaign. Lord knows I don't want to go there. But to emphasize just how much the truth was an issue in this election. When Mitt Romney's senior campaign advisor said his candidate could etch a sketch his positions, that should have told us something. There's a deeper point here. It is in the nature of politicians. It is in the nature of politicians sometimes to exaggerate. I know that. Hyperbole is one of the tools of the trade. But running a campaign based on the belief that the public was too ignorant to remember what you said or wouldn't care because you weren't the other guy, well, as my friend George Will said, <laughs> quit despising the American people. And the quote from George Will. I quoted George Will. <laughs> uh, but Mr. Will missed a critical point here. Why did the Romney campaign think bald-faced lies were a good campaign strategy? Well, why does anybody lie? Why does anybody lie? Not just because they think it will work, because they've seen it work. If we in the media are honest, and I am in the media, I work for both CNN and ABC News. We enable the culture of disinformation. I'm being polite because the way we approach information and debate can be described in a host of ways. We've seen fact-checking sites online and in print proliferate recently. And that's a good thing. There are blogs that correct liberal bias and blogs that catch conservative imbalance. But it raises a question, where are the journalists? Why are they not fact-checking? Why are the people who are doing the interviews and the investigations, why are they not doing their job? Even the pundits and the opinion makers should be constrained by facts and required to support positions with evidence and logic. If we were doing that today, ladies and gentlemen, we would have a different conversation about the so-called fiscal cliff. A media that plays he said, she said, that's more interested in access than accuracy isn't doing its job. Perhaps nothing illustrates the problem more than the controversy over Nate Silva. He, he's a blogger for the New York Times. He comes up with these little mathematical models of who might win and who might lose based on the numbers. I'm, I've never been a numbers woman, but I even played a Powerball. Once they said my chance was one in 175 million, I said, I'm going back to making gumbo. <laughs> Finishing up all of that leftover turkey. But Nate Silva came under a lot of attack. He came out, he was just trying to look at the numbers. And yet there were so many in the mainstream media and others who just criticized him because he was getting it right and that it wasn't fitting the, the so-called narrative of the race. The point is that candidates' duplicity can succeed only with the media complicity. But we can take this. And you know what it's like to go on TV and you agree with the conservative or the conservative agree with you and yet we have to play these roles, I'm liberal, 
This one is conservative. Well, some days I'm conservative, you know? I mean, on some subjects I'm very conservative. You'll never find me make my gumbo without putting, you know, filet in it. <laughs> That's an old time way of making gumbo. I don't do it in the little instant moment. But they like to split us up. They like to divide us. We have the left, we have the right, we have the conservative, we have the... Rep and then often they, they say, well, we need, we need to talk about race. We got a black woman on television. Let's talk about race. <laughs> oh, we need to talk about gender. We got a woman on TV. Let's talk about that. And I often have to tell them I'm getting old and grumpy. What category will that fit one day, huh? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have to remember the words of Thomas Jefferson, who said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. We have a responsibility to educate ourselves, to be informed, to ask critical questions, to know what those questions really are. Passions are important, but if they blind us to reality, let me give you an example. Have you ever seen those yellow support the troops ribbons? Sometimes they come in red, white, and blue, patriotic. Who doesn't believe that we should support our brave men and women? But do you know how your representative, a senator, voted on the last veteran benefit or jobs bill? Because we don't talk about it. It's not sensational enough. It's not sexy enough. And by the way, I've had more conversations about sex and birth control than I've had an opportunity to read Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> don't ask your parents about that tonight, please. Now, what now? We have to maintain our enthusiasm and channel it into becoming better informed. More reason in our debates, more civil in our conversations, more expectant of the words journalists and standards belong together. The second choice was money or people. Money or people. Now, this is really a, a consequence of the first. Money talks, and it tried to do a lot of talking in this past election. I believe that Citizens United will prove to be one of the worst Supreme Court decisions ever. <laughs> if the past election hasn't already confirmed that, the advent of the super PAC, the introduction of unsupervised outside money, nobody knew where a lot of the money came from. Accountability matters in our democracy. For example, in Cincinnati, vote intimidation billboards went up in poor neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, and the sign company when pressed to dis disclose who paid for them, who put them up, he didn't know. There was no, it was blank. Now, how can it be blank? How can it be put up by anonymous? Someone paid for it. It's very important, ladies and gentlemen, to find ways to curtail all of this money in politics. You don't need a billion dollars, six billion dollars to run a campaign. We spent six billion dollars this election cycle. And I can tell you that was a lot of wasted money. The flood of money threatened, threatened to drown the voters' internal lie detector. It wasn't just the negativity of the ads or the hysterical hyperbole of so many of them. They, they reminded me of the the shaft, the stripes of, of metal fall airplanes would drop in World War II to overwhelm a radar system with a false echo. There was so much stuff filling the airways, it was hard to see clearly through it all. In the election, in the end, President Obama ground game beat corporate money air attack. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we've come to our fiscal census. Corporations are not people, and they should not be allowed to essentially buy or bribe their way to control our country. Uh, people versus money is not just an election issue. It spills over, so to speak, into fiscal policy, and thus the next big choice we had in the campaign. Would we opt for economic fairness, or would we yield to the robber baron vulture capitalism. I got that from Rick Perry, oops. 
God, I, I used to pray when I would go to those Republican debates and he started talking. I'm like, dear God, don't, don't you know, because as a Southerner, you just don't like that. And he would just sit there and say, Lord, please. Somebody just pat him on the back. Just Maybe it's just cough it out. <laughs> Oops. Well, although Governor Romney disavowed his infamous 47% comment, his remarks after the election when he claimed that President Obama won because he gave gifts to his base. I'm still waiting for it. I got a gift bag. Anybody want to fill it? Shows an indifference. Shows an indifference, even contempt for the sense of fair play, shared responsibility, and hard work that that's as much a part of the American dream as making it big. As my friend George Will also said, and I'm quoting George, it's been well said that you have a political problem when the voters don't like you, but, you, but you've got a real problem when the voters think you don't like them. <laughs> uh, it would be a mistake to think that Romney is the only one who despises the American people in this way. Perhaps despise, despises is the wrong word. Perhaps dismiss, dismisses is better, regardless after the election, Paul Ryan and Eric Cantor were still pushing an Ann Ryan-like budget that would decrease social services and increase the tax burden on the poor and the middle class. Senator McConnell observed correctly that Obamacare is now the law of the land, then walked the statement back. And let's be clear, the attack on the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is rooted in a robber baron culture, a robber baron vulture capitalism mentality. I'll have more to say about health care debate, which shouldn't be, but there's a high profit motive driving it. Wendell Potter, the former head of public relations at Cigna, explained Wall Street strange hole on health care. And he said, and I quote, if company, if one's company medical loss ratio was 79.9% in one quarter, and next quarter it was 78.2%, it seems like a small movement. But investors will think that's ridiculous and it's horrible. The term medical loss ratio is the insurance company newspeak term for paying health care benefits. Simply put, the goal of investors and insurance companies is to spend as little as possible on actual health care. What now? We have to be aware that, to use the cl cliché, throwing Romney under the bus doesn't mean the Republicans are getting, getting off it. If Bobby Jindal, my governor from my home state of Louisiana, said Republicans shouldn't be, party, shouldn't be the party that protects the rich, Yet he refuses to implement the Obamacare Medicaid expansion that would greatly benefit the poor and the disabled, the non-rich in my home state. And some conservatives still want to privatize Social Security and Medicare even after, after the financial fiscal meltdown of the Bush years. Now, speaking of the fiscal, the current debate, now, you know I'm Catholic, so I start low, go slow, rise high, strike fire, sit down. I'm, I'm, Tim, I'll get this. I'll get this promise you. We're not like those Baptists. <laughs> we take our time. I love you, Baptists. <laughs> and speaking of the fiscal, the current debate on the so-called fiscal cliff, which according to many analysts is really a fiscal pothole, this is an example of the ongoing fair share versus Robin, robber baron debate. Two points here. It's a, it's a fiscal pothole because if the deadline passes, a lot of the problems, the automatic cuts will cause, can be fixed retroactively, some people believe, by the new Congress. Kevin Drum of Mother Jones has a good article explaining the economics of it all. But this goes back to the truth choice and the responsibility of the media. Fiscal cliff is more dramatic, more panic-inducing than fiscal staircase. We need to ask, why do politicians in the media operate always in crisis mode? Is that the only way to get our, uh, our attention, the only way we'll become high information citizens, or is it the way to keep low information, low information to suppress in political involvement or engagement by ordinary citizens? I don't know the answer to those questions, but what now? They need to be asked, and we need to discuss them. Our economic problems are solvable if we don't equate the deficit with an immediate foreclosure on our future, if we don't accept evasions and exemption for the wealthy and austerity, austerity for the rest of us, 
Obamacare will reduce the deficit, requiring the rich to pay their fair share, the same percentage they paid when Bill Clinton was president, will also go a long way in filling our fiscal potholes. <laughs> and folks, as diverse, I tweet all about it, as diverse as Warren Buffett and Stephen King have said, taxes more. And in fact, Bill Crystal, he's on Fox News, a bona fide conservative as they come. He said, you know what? It won't kill the country if we raise taxes a little bit on millionaires. Thomas Jefferson said, I hope that we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our money corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. He wasn't a member of the Boston Tea Party, but there is still an irony in all of this. So, people are equal, not the same, but equal. Government exists to protect equality, which means equal access to life, equal access to liberty, and equal access to the pursuit of happiness. If we insist, if we insist on being part of the discussion and the debate, we will find solutions to all of our problems. Now, this brings me to another truth about the last election. The past election was a triumph for diversity, a diversity. I woke up the day after the election and I started reading, we're diverse. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> there are black people, there are Hispanics, there are Asian Americans, there are openly gay people, and yes, there are women, lots of them too. <laughs> Who knew? My God, this was a triumph for diversity. For what, in another irony, should be a conservative value that we live in a nation where we are not judged by the color of our skin, but the content of our character. After the election, Fox News' Bill O'Reilly lamented that the demographics are changing. The white establishment is now the minority. That dirge was echoed by many on the right with names that, again, ironically testified to the diversity of our country. There's a tendency to sanitize our history, to appropriate the term traditional American value, are now, in dog whistle terms, traditional American voter, and talk about one side of the equation. But the white establishment, quote unquote, built this power on the backs of others, women, blacks, other minorities, Native Americans, and immigrants. Our history is messy. Our history is very messy and scarred with slogans. Perhaps we should spend more time studying the nitty gritty of our history and less time putting it through the blender of the banal. <laughs> this isn't just about big government or small government, but Goldilocks government. Just the right size to secure the rights of all the people, all whom are created equal. Secure their rights against robber baron conglomerates and secure their rights against the imposition of an just ideology. If we are to be a free society, we must be a diverse society. We don't have to agree. We don't even have to approve, but we have no right to subjugate others. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at some point we're going to shift the paradigm. And ever so, and ever so slightly, this is going to have to bring us to the fifth choice that we face in this past election. Would we be a country with open doors for the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free? For the wretched refused, the homeless, the temp tempest toast, will we lift our lamp beside the golden door? Or will we bar the entrance to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, slam it shut in their faces? We associate open door with immigration. And certainly, that's appropriate. One of the great issues before us, what now, will be immigration reform. It's a messy issue, like our history, as John Stewart observed, and we won't find a workable solution relying on slogans like the well-known, a well-named Dream Act, or descriptions like illegal immigrants that, however accurate, have taken on dog whistle overtones. The Latino vote guaranteeing immigration will be an issue, 
What it can't guarantee is that we'll look at our own history. Hispanic influence goes beyond Tex-Mex cuisine or the sordid record of immigrants. When it comes to immigration, before we can have a solution, we need a resolution. And not a New Year's resolution of good intentions without a change in attitude. We have to stop being afraid of people who are different and stop allowing ourselves and stop allowing ourselves to be manipulated into the other. We are Americans, and the American pie is big enough, big enough for all of us to get a slice. Now, there's also another issue about access, and that is access to the polls. There's no place in our democracy for four, five, six, seven hour lines. There's no place in our democracy for purging eligible citizens right before an election, or forcing people to, sh to bring multiple forms of ID. Thank you, Minnesota, for rejecting that. We must have an open door to the voting process as well. There's no more fundamental right than access to the polls. The litany of abuses is too long to go, to go into right now. Suffice to say, voter fraud itself is a fraud. <laughs> this is the simple what now. Reform the election process so that we have a standard system so that voting is easy. No long lines, no ID tests, no caging, no machines without a paper trail or some means of independent verification. We should protect everyone's right to vote in this country because a person without a vote is a person without protection. That thought comes from Lyndon Baines Johnson, who also said the vote is the most powerful instrument ever devised for breaking down injustice and destroying the terrible walls which imprison people because they are different. Let's keep the door open for all people. Finally, The sixth choice we face in this election, will we move, move forward on health care or backwards? Will Obamacare remain the law of the land or be repealed on day one? It was a debate that occupied us for a long time, and now we know we're going to keep Obamacare, but we're going to have to protect it every step of the way as we implement it across the country. Here's what I know as a child born at Charity Hospital in New Orleans. Here's what I know. No one should lose their home because they cannot pay a medical bill. No one should suffer or even die because they can't afford a prescription drug. And everyone should pay into the system because at some point we all need health care for ourselves or our loved ones. And again, we should not fear government involvement in our health care system. That is, a, there is an appropriate role for government in helping to implement the new law. And speaking of the fear of government, and this is our last issue, because I know Tim is getting nervous. <laughs> this past election, we had to choose between hope and fear. One campaign argued we should be afraid Afraid of women making choices about their health care, young people making choices about their education or choices voters would make, or what would happen to faith in God if climate change was real, as if God is so limited. <laughs> One campaign feared the 47% and loathed the 99%. The other campaign argued for hope, perhaps not as much as the last time around, but perhaps more in a different way. But this, too, is still a choice that still confront us. It is the last of the seven issues, but in some way, hope versus fear is the biggest what now. It is the biggest what now of all. We have problems. Some can be solved. Some are innate to the nature of being human, of needing political solutions in order to form a more perfect union or establish justice and secure the blessings. 
I would like to close with a few thoughts on our choices on the what now that lies ahead. We can approach the future afraid to care too much, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, for fear that the other person does not care at all. Or we can approach the future as Babe Ruth approached the plate, never letting the fear striking out hold us back because we're Americans and we're resilient. And when we come together, we somehow or another find ways to stick together, to support one another. We can ask ourselves what now and realize the future will move us forward in increments, step by step, and that we will have failures. We will make mistakes. There will be distress. There will be crises to manage. But we will, we will come back and we can rebuild stronger and safer in the future. But I keep the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. close to me, and I hope you will too as I close. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Never lose hope. What now? We have each other, and we have a great country. And let's go forward together to seize the moment and to have a blessed future. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna Brazil. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church in Nicollet Mall, downtown Minneapolis. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You're going to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is political strategist Donna Brazil. We'll be taking questions from our, for our speaker from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Twitter handle is Westminster THF. Find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. And now while the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I want to thank the co-sponsor of today's program, the YWCA of Minneapolis and its president, Becky Roloff, for their commitment to empowering women and girls and to promoting racial and gender justice. And now, Donna Brazil, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First question, has, first question has to do with religion and politics. Over the years, you've been involved in a lot of campaigns, and uh, I'm interested in hearing your perspective on the rise of religion as an, as an issue uh, in, in the campaigns and the, uh, leading towards success or failure in campaigns. Well, I've always believed in the separation of church and state, but there's no question that as a public servant, my faith has guided me in the decisions that I've had to make, but the passion and, and giving back. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And that is something I believe in. But to use religion uh, to demean and, and to divide, and, and what we've seen in this last election, to somehow or another tell a woman what right she has or right she cannot have with regards to her own body, or to make one's sexual orientation uh, a topic of religious fever. I think we have to be very careful how religion is used in our society, and I think our politicians and our political leaders uh, must also be extremely mindful of the fact that though we are a religious nation, there are many of our fellow citizens who are not part of the faithful, and yet they have strong beliefs. And so I am very careful not to allow my Catholicism to in any way um, cloud my judgment or to impose my beliefs on other people. What are two concrete steps each of us can take to protect voting for all of us? Well, you did one. This <laughs> I think we have to be very mindful that there's an attempt in this country uh, to dilute the voting power and strength of, of ordinary citizens who just want to you know, go out there and have a say in the election. We are 
we are we the people, not we the corporations, or are we the special interests. And so it's important that we have access to the ballot box. Uh, I would hope that we would spend the next two years cleaning up all of the electoral mess that we made over the past four years when many of our political leaders tried to change the rules in the middle of the game. My mother once called that cheating. forward from the audience here about uh, the continued push against UN Secretary Rice and her possibility of being nominated for Secretary of State. Could you comment on that, please? You know, I've been, first of all, I thought it was quite bizarre. Four Americans died. Four brave Americans, including our ambassador. We should focus on getting to the bottom of what happened, who killed them, and bringing them to justice. Instead, they're treating Susan Rice as if she was over there in Benghazi, and she did the shooting. Um, I'm, I'm, I, am, I am profoundly distressed over the tone and tenor of the conversation that's taking place over the potential nomination. She hasn't been nominated. Susan Rice has served this country with honor and distinction, and not only for this president, Barack Obama, but also for Bill Clinton. She served in the Clinton administration. She's well qualified if the president decides to nominate her, nominate her to be Secretary of State to hold that position. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that Hillary Clinton did a fantastic job in that capacity. But I, I would hope that Senator McCain and Senator Graham and others will give her an opportunity if she is nominated by the president to make her case. Uh, you know, in the fog of war, you know, the intelligence is often proved wrong. We saw that with Colin Powell, who went to the United Nations and had charts and grabbing a little vial of this or that. Uh, back in the, uh, the Bay of Pigs, Eli Stevenson, also in the fog of war, the intelligence proved not to be uh, as accurate. So why don't we just give the, the investigators an opportunity to uncover what really happened before we begin to, what I call, do that little partisan thing and say, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Susan Rice deserves better. She's a great American, and I will always support her. What topic of discussion would you like to have if you were a guest at the Romney-Obama luncheon today? Hold the hot sauce. We've had a lot of hot sauce. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I have come to know a lot of politicians by virtue of not only being in the political arena for so much of my adult life and my childhood too. I, I like to think that, you know, I know President Obama's a good man, Mitt Romney's a good man. I mean, let's put the good of the country ahead of our little political parties. Our political parties are so small. I mean, the majority of voters are no longer Democrats or Republicans. You're independent. You're not even affiliated with either the, you know, the major political parties, and yet we, we pretend that you belong to me and you belong to me, but you know what? The majority of you decide that I'm out of here. <laughs> Bye. And so I think they should figure out two or three things that they could do well and, and follow up on it. It's a shame that after a contentious election, the loser has to go and sit down and rehabilitate his or her life when perhaps there are some good ideas that could come from the other campaign, the other side, and say, if you're willing to fight for it, you know, maybe we can make it happen. So I don't, I'm not saying that Mitt Romney's shelf life should exist for the next four years. <laughs> but I'm, I am saying that let's find what we can do together, especially given the quote unquote, the conversation that we're having now about the so-called fiscal pothole, staircase, slope, you know, cliff that we're about to all experience together. Here's a question from a Minnesota high school student. The most complicated question we've had today. Okay. <laughs> Would you welcome a budget compromise defined by Republican ideas, for instance, capping deductions to raise revenues, or would that be inconsistent with your values? A yes. You know, I wasn't a math major, but I do believe that the math needs to add up. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get our fiscal house in order, but we cannot do it one hand tied behind our backs. We cannot do it by just cutting services and, and programs designed to help the poor, middle class, and working class. I believe that every child in America should have a head start and a healthy start in life. I believe that we should be able to protect our environment. I believe that we should, when we open up a can of peanut butter, a can of uh, tuna fish, 
The FDA should have the resources to make sure that it's not poison and that we are well protected. I also believe that we need to tackle uh, climate change in this country. Let me tell you, I grew up in the Hurricane Alley. And so I, I believe that we need to allow these taxes to raise. Look, if, if they do nothing, we're going to go back to the defense budget of 2007, and we're going to go back to the tax rate of the Clinton-Gore years that produced 23, 23 million jobs. And we had a fiscal surplus when we left office and handed over to George Bush and Dick Cheney. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. What has inspired you to continue pursuing politics in such a frustratingly partisan atmosphere? You know, my grandmother was a wonderful woman. She grew up in the state of Mississippi, and so every evening when we would come home from school and she would tell us to take off our good clothes, and, and we'd go out and play for two hours, and we would come in and we had dinner, and then afterwards, Grandma would call us in the room and order our birth. Cheryl, Sheila, Donna, Tata, Chet, Lisa, Demetri, Kevin, Zilla. There were nine of us. My parents were two, three jobs. My mother was a maid, my father a janitor, and when my mother got off from work, she went and served parties downtown the French Quarter on St. Charles Avenue, and my father did all kind of odd jobs so that they could take care of us, and they put eight out of nine of us through college. <laughs> what inspires me to stay in public service is that my parents could never have done this without help. Without the support of our community, our church, our neighbors, but also the government. Yes, many of us had to go to school on Pell Grant student loans. Some of us played basketball and I got bad knees for it. <laughs> but we had help. And so what inspires me to stay in public life, to stay out here each and every day, is because I want to give that next child a head start and a healthy start. I want that next kid who grows up poor, with a struggling mother who was so so tired. Three days before she died, she said, I'm too tired. She was 52. She had no health care. I lost my dad just a few months ago. He was 81. He had health care because he was a veteran. Four brown stars in Korea. But I watched my mom die because she had no ability to get health care. Throughout my years in public life, I said I will always work until we get health care. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to continue to work and fight to implement health care for all people. That's why I do it, and that's why I'm not giving up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.